have faith is also to have doubt. There are so many questions we have and we let them pile up. And so we keep taking those questions and we keep putting them aside because we're scared to ask or scared to know the answers. Today is the third Sunday of Ask Me Anything. And as you know, Pastor Andy's daughter graduated yesterday. Uh, she's going to be a nurse at uh, Texas Children's Hospital, and he is full of joy and enjoying that complete celebration. And he chose the three of us to be the people today that we're going to answer the questions. So we're happy to be here. Thank you so much for turning in your questions, whether you wrote them out or whether you did it on email. We are delighted. You are asking some very important questions. And church is the best place to have a very, very dangerous conversation. So I ask you, continue these topics, continue these questions in your small groups, your Sunday school classes. Uh, no matter where you go, keep the conversation going. And so now we're going to have the first question, and I do believe it's mine. I am in a marriage where my partner has been and continues to be unfaithful. Divorce seems like my only option, but Jesus said such harsh things about divorce. What do I do? Well, that is indeed a tough question and one that we do need to talk about. And for the person that wrote that, I am so sorry that you are going through uh, that trouble in your life. And I'm probably the best one to receive the question because I have lived through a divorce. And so I know how you're feeling. And in this room today, there are many of you that have differing opinions about it. But again, we invite you to talk about it. So let me tell you what happened with me and what I did about my situation. Whenever it got to the point where I could not figure out what I was going to do, the first place I went was to my church. And I talked to my pastor and I told my pastor the whole story. And he prayed with me, worked with me, knew my family well. And after a while, he went ahead and sent me on to a Christian counselor, which I highly recommend. That Christian counselor worked with me, worked with my children. And you're noticing that I'm saying work with me because my spouse would not go. I had to go alone. But it was the best thing I ever did. So in the Bible, and I think it's Malachi, God says, I hate divorce. And in the New Testament, Jesus talks strongly about divorce. You know why he does that? Because the family is the way that he decided to put us into these family situations where we can be loved and nurtured and we can raise children up to be people of God. That's why he doesn't want divorce is because that fractures whenever there is a divorce, not only the couple, but then the children, and it just trickles on out. The mother-in-law that I absolutely loved was all of a sudden one day not my mother-in-law. 
And so it trickles out and out and out. So for you, I would say, go to your church. Pray with a pastor. Let them know. Get on the prayer list. And then seek Christian counseling before you make any decision at all. And if your partner will go with you, oh my gosh, reconciliation is the best of everything. Reconciliation is exactly what the Lord wants us to do. The social principles of the United Methodist Church say, and you can read them today, that God loves the family. He wants the family unit to be strong. He wants the children to be healthy. But sometimes things happen where that is breaking down. And so, regrettably, divorce does happen sometimes. And so the social principles say, make sure that you are cautious with all of the relationships that are a part of what is happening. And for you out there that have various thoughts on this, be really careful not to judge until you have walked in somebody's shoes. And to you, to you young people up in the balcony and down here, I give you this charge. Make sure you ask God if the person that you are dating and you are ready to marry is the person that he wants you to marry. I guess one thing I would say about it is uh, that's a, it's a really good question for this panel, and I doubt if the people choosing the questions knew this, but two of us, because I've been through divorce also, and the one thing I would add to what Ann said is when you've been through something that's really horrible like that, my, where I was is I didn't think I could, it didn't occur to me that I could be forgiven. And when I went back to my church, my pastor said, Bill, God's grace is sufficient. He's already forgiven you. Forgive yourself. There's always a place in God's heart. Nothing separates you from his love. Okay. That's good word. I think we're ready for question number two. I struggle with trusting the Bible when it was written and edited by sinful human beings. How can I trust the Bible to be true when people have used it to justify slavery and use it today to marginalize other people? It's a morning for pretty serious questions. Um, so the Bible has been misused and abused. It, it, historically, it was used to justify slavery, and, and on the flip side of that coin, it bolstered the abolitionists. Um, it's been used to justify spousal abuse. It's been used to say that there's divine approval for misogyny in the church and elsewhere. And um, if you have been on the receiving end, it's been used for other things too. If you've been on the receiving end of any of that, for that I'm sorry. Um, God grieves with us for the ways that his word has been abused. But as I come to this question about how can we trust the Bible when it's been so misused, I think it's a question about how we read the Bible, about how we approach the text. You know, um, as a United Methodist Christian, I read the Bible with everything that I have. I read the Bible with all of my historical understanding. I read the Bible looking for cultural understanding. I read the Bible thinking about the tradition of the church, how the church has typically interpreted a text. I read the Bible with my own experiences in mind, with my own reason. And I think that that is a different way of reading the Bible than taking it completely at face value. 
And I know that there's a spectrum of thought on that, that some of us read the Bible literally and others of us read the Bible um, in other ways. But, but I think that as you approach the Bible, the most important lens that we use is the lens of Jesus. And there's the Mark resource coming out. And in week two, there are four, in that section, there are four ways to read the Bible. And as I was working on that particular section, I was talking with my husband, and this should tell me something, because I've used him twice today, so um, clearly he is the brains in the family. Um, but I was talking to my husband, and he said that the way that he thinks about it is that Jesus is the prism through which we see Scripture. If you think about a prism, a, a prism refracts light, so that when light goes into a prism, it comes out as a rainbow. And he said, when I look at a text, I, I look at it and I think about Jesus as that prism. And I think about what needs to come out the other side. Um, and so he always approaches a text and he says, what would Jesus say and do about that? Because the thing is that as we get to know Jesus in here, we learn that the God that we worship is a God who eats with sinners and who heals the sick and gives sight to the blind and is uh, alongside those who are poor and oppressed. And that's a very different thing than using the Bible to marginalize other people. It, it opens up a world of possibilities for interpretation that could lead us down a much more beautiful road. Um, I think that this is really a question of how, how do we read it when we know it's been misused? And I think we read it with Jesus in mind and thinking about how Jesus would handle that. But it's a really tough question. Either of y'all want to add anything? <laughs> wow. What a great answer. You did a great job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're serious. <laughs> I'm telling, I, I, I give it, I, that I, I could have owned that line, um, but if anyone sees David Horton, tell him that I did not. I agree with what she said, because even in the first question, you always go back and look at Jesus in everything you do. And if you are um, looking at Jesus and see how he loves people and how he forgives people, and if you are following along with that, then as you read, you are getting the absolute most out of your Bible. When in doubt, follow Jesus. Yeah, I want to meet your husband. He sounds like a smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're Next ready question. for ready. question number three. All right. How do we clear our thoughts of all the things we have been forgiven for by God? How do we clear our thoughts of all the things we have been forgiven for by God? Years of prayers have not removed them from my thoughts nearly daily. Hmm. Hmm. First, I would say that I can identify with this question because... When we know that we have done something wrong, and believe me, I have been in that position before, as I'm sure most of us have been, when we know we have done something wrong, even though we know that Jesus has forgiven us, sometimes it's hard to forgive ourselves. And the things keep coming up. We ruminate over them. Uh, when Anne got the divorce question, I thought about how long it took me to forgive myself over something really bad that had happened in my life. Um, I think faced with that, we continue to pray, we continue to read scripture, we spend time with our Christian friends who are spiritually mature, and I think if someone really has trouble dealing with an issue, another thought I would have, and Brandy's going to talk about that in a little bit in a way, we, there are Christian counselors, or Anne actually mentioned that before also, that there are people who are specifically trained to do counseling. 
that can help us approach the issues in our lives that are really difficult to get past. Um, talking to your pastor is a good thing to do, but a long-term relationship with either a Christian counselor. We also have a Stephen Ministry program, people who are trained to do some pastoral care that could possibly go through a process with someone who is having difficulty with an issue like this. But I would emphasize that this is a common problem. I'm not surprised to see the question because it's something we deal with so often. So I'd like to add, and I'd like to tell you what Anne does about this question, because it is so important, and we're all guilty of it. We've committed a sin way back when, and we just keep bringing it up and bringing it up and living with it over and over, and it just takes you down. So in the Old Testament, there's this wonderful scripture about <clears throat> when we repent, God takes our sin he takes it to the deepest part of the ocean, mm -hmm. he buries it, and he remembers it no more. Amen. I love that, and I have taught that to my Sunday school class. I live by it, but let me tell you what we do. We put on scuba gear, and we put on a mask and a tank, and we go straight down, and we try to find out where he buried him because we want to live it again. But he has said, it is gone. I do not remember it anymore. So if you do anything today as you pray and worship, let it go right here. Let him take it to the bottom of the sea. Let him bury it and remember it no more. He promised that's but, what he will do. But Ann, I have a question. For you, but the scar remains, and maybe the scar is okay because I'm a different person because of the scar. Do, does that seem? What do you? I would go. So I, I always remember that when Jesus appears to his disciples, when he after the resurrection, the scars are still there. Uh -huh. um, that even though he has. Uh, defeated death, that he is victorious. It's this amazing story, but the scars are still there because they tell them, they tell that he is really the one who was crucified. He is really Jesus of Nazareth. And so um, I think that your scar stories, whether they're you know physical scars that you wear on your body or they're things that God has healed, a scar is different than a festering open wound. Um, a scar is something that's had all that tissue go and, and heal it, and whereas a wound is still open and, and sore. But I don't Even know. like a tree, you can saw off a limb of a tree, and if you wait long enough, you can see how it grows back that's over, true. and it becomes a thing of beauty. There was a scar there hmm. for a long time, but it became a thing of beauty. And that's what he wants to do, is use us and move us on past some of these things that weighed us down. But the thing for us to remember, and the person who submitted this question to remember, is that scar does not separate us from his love. Mm -hmm. Does not separate us from his love. Amen. Okay, I think we have an extra question have a few more minutes. Explain it. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll do what I did in the first service and just stand up for a minute and say, I, I knew this question was coming because I complained to the team. They gave Andy the scientist question and I'm the scientist, okay? But I understand why Andy took his approach. We, we don't explain evolution in church, okay? The, the real question is, is there a conflict between science, knowledge of the physical world, between science and religion? And no, there's really not. If you look at the social principles of the United Methodist Church, we honor all forms of knowledge, cosmology, biology, all of those things. Um, St. Augustine, 
early, early in Christian history, the great theologian, St. Augustine, preached the doctrine of two books. He said, there is but one truth. God has given us revealed knowledge of his presence in the world, and he has also given us creation, nature. And he has given us both, but there is just one truth. Two books, one truth, okay? And he says, both books are complicated and require interpretation. And it comes down to a matter of how you interpret scripture. And traditionally, the Christian church has not fought with science. All of this uh, is kind of a tempest in a teapot. In the United Methodist Church, there is room in the house for literal interpretation and other types of interpretation, and none of that should separate us from the way we love each other. I do think it's a question on, on the, the connection between faith and science, and I, I just read a book of, that was about um, how we experience God in the world, and the thing that that this writer was reminding me and I had forgotten was that um, the person who went and, and was the beginner of the Big Bang Theory was actually a Catholic monk. Um, and the reason that he started exploring this was he started wondering, how could God speak the world into existence? How could there be a moment? And then that is, that is the birth of the Big Bang Theory was with the church. Um, and so historically, there's not been a conflict. Um, I'm not going to go into, I, I don't know the answer to the explain evolution question. I just, <laughs> that's, that's about as far as I get. I have uh, two very good friends. Both of them are ordained pastors and both of them are scientists. And I have loved um, being with them and listening to uh, the whole process of how they look at nature and science and God and how they look at the Bible. And one of them has written a book, and I'll get it for you. Um, I think it's called A Physics Teacher Looks at the Bible. It, it is amazing, and it is so interesting to look at all this and just see what our God can do. So I would invite you, as you continue your conversations in your small groups and your Sunday school classes, get one of those books and read it and come to your own conclusions about it. Amen. So as we're concluding, I, I want to make a final note about um, the question. So we have a committee that has been selecting these questions for the pastors. So the pastors haven't seen the questions, but the committee has been selecting them. And earlier this week, that, that committee came to me and said that they had had lots and lots of questions submitted about depression and about suicide and about other mental health um, things. And so we want to say a word as a church about the fact that if that is you, if you find yourself in a place where you are suffering or hurting, that you don't need to go do that alone. Um, that, there are, that there are resources for you. I want to open the door again, as, as Bill has opened the door, and I think Ann did too, to, to say contact a pastor. The church phone number is on your screen. You can also find a church phone number on uh, the website. And, and we are here to point you in the right direction. Um, if we can't help you, we will find a resource that can. And also on the screen, you'll notice uh, K Towns. Uh, the Reverend K Towns is a um, licensed clinical practitioner, of, uh, uh, a licensed clinical therapist, I believe. Um, I don't know her title. But she, uh, she works here at the church with people who are suffering. And so if you know that you need professional help, please reach out. Um, the, the, there is no shame in that, and there is definitely grace for that.